All right, good day, everyone. Welcome here back to Keys to Christ Ministries. We're thankful that you can join us here today. We've been on a about a two-week hiatus. Actually, last Sunday, my wife delivered our fourth child, a beautiful baby girl. And, you know, so last week we were going through that. And um, we're thankful that we can be here back today by God's grace, be able to study the Word of God together and to continue through our study in the book of Revelation. We're looking today at the church of Thyatira, the fourth church in the series of seven churches that we're going to be looking at. We've looked at Ephesus so far, Smyrna, Pergamos, and now we're going to continue in Thyatira. So I pray that your spiritual juices are ready to flow so that we can study the word of God. Um, At this time, I'm going to have my son Alonzo come and share a Bible verse here for today. We pray that it would be encouraging to you all. Hi, and my name is Alonzo, and I'm going to be sharing with you a Bible verse. And the Bible verse is found from um, Nehemiah 2, 4, and it says, The king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I pray to the God of heaven. And we should pray to the God of heaven in those circumstances. So I hope this is a blessing to you. God bless. All right. All right, friends. So we're ready to have a word of prayer and to begin our study for today. Just getting all of the technical stuff behind the camera um, done so that it can flow smoothly. But we're going to pray and ask God for his spirit as we go to study his word. Let's have a word of prayer. Our loving Father, which art in heaven, we thank you today that we can study your word. We thank you, Lord that at any time and any place, we can call upon you. And you said that you would be near. That we are to seek you with all of our heart. And you said that we that you would be found of us. So we pray, dear God, that we would find Jesus Christ today. As we search, as he searches our hearts, help us to search the scriptures and to find Jesus in the scriptures. To find that... Um, faith that we need to endure the trials now and soon to come. Please keep back evil angels from our presence, and please, Father, dwell in our hearts by faith. We ask that you would please forgive us of our sins, that you would please cleanse us of all unrighteousness, and we pray for the Holy Spirit to teach us, to lead us, and to guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So we're looking at the church of Thyatira. We're looking at the church of Thyatira here today. Again, we've looked at the past three churches. We've seen Ephesus. We've seen Smyrna, Pergamos. And now we're tracing all the way down to the church of Thyatira. And one thing that we want to understand as we study these churches is that these churches are, um, they are time periods they are a progression 
of the Christian church from the days that Jesus Christ ascended into heaven after his resurrection and after 40 days with the disciples after his resurrection all the way until he went into heaven where the Bible says that he has gone and he has ascended and that he will come in like manner as we have seen him go up. And we found out looking at Revelation as we've studied the sanctuary that Jesus ascended up and he went into the sanctuary of heaven. But the sanctuary has two different apartments, even that tabernacle. It has the holy place with the candlesticks, with the table of showbread, with the altar of incense. And it also has the most holy place with the Ark of the Covenant, where is covered the law of God, the Ten Commandments. We've seen that in our study of the sanctuary. And we've seen that with Ephesus, from 31 AD to 100 AD, Jesus was in the holy place. And it continued as well in the time of Smyrna, in the time of Pergamos, and even in the time of Thyatira that we're going to look at here today, Jesus is still in the holy place of the sanctuary. And this is so important that we may know the work that Jesus is doing. In the holy place, we see the work of the candlesticks to let our light shine, that others may behold our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Through these time periods, even though there is apostasy in these time periods of Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos, Ephesus leaving their first love, allowing the Nicolaitans to come in, these liberals, these uh, these partiers, these, these uh, free grace, no law, no rules, no standards, uh, individuals to come into the church in the time period of Ephesus, which led to Smyrna a time of great persecution for God's people in which those who profess to be God's people betrayed their own professed brethren and sisters into the hands of the state, the Roman power of the Rome of the Caesars. But God saw a faithful people who, who are rich in faith, rich towards God. And it led down this time period of Smyrna. Of course, all these time periods lead to one another. Ephesus losing their first love led to Smyrna, led to Pergamos, where we see individuals who, wanting to gain favor with the state, they mingled with the state, even Constantine wanting to bring his empire and all his subjects into his realm, wanting to gain even the Christians, professed to be a Christian himself, baptized himself, which led to Satan's seat being exalted, which led to this false educational system of Balaam and Balak, which led to the Nicolaitans exalting themselves even more during this time period. And all of the apostasies that went on in Ephesus, in Smyrna, and in Pergamos has led to the great apostasy in Thyatira. This this time period of Thyatira is one of the greatest time periods of apostasy within the Christian church. Because we're going to see here in the time period of Thyatira that there are actually two groups. And we've seen this throughout our studies. There's actually two groups. A faithful group and an unfaithful group. One who clings to the word of God and the other who clings to the traditions of men. One who exalts God, his word, and Jesus Christ as the true mediator between God and man, and one who exalts man, priests, and the Pope as a mediator between God and man. Friends, we are seeing everything from the past three churches of Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos culminate in this great apostasy of Thyatira. Of this great time of apostasy, of falling away. What time period did that run until? We see here all the time periods, 31 AD to 100 AD, 100 AD to around 313, 323, in which there is great persecution, there is a false conversion of of an emperor, Constantine, 
Pergamus, this, this time period of civil uh, depreciation of the civil power and the exaltation of the religious power in the civil power as they were combining to create something called of this time period of Thyatira where church and state fully united. The church finally gained full control of the state in what time? In the year 538 A.D. In the year 538 A.D. The last of the tribes, the Aryan tribes, were uprooted and in 538, the papal power, the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church gained full control of the Empire of Rome, of the European Empire, of the ten tribes. Basically, three were uprooted, the Bible says, but none of those seven that remain created what we know as the European Union. In the year 538, the papacy gained full control of the world at that time. They gained full control. And we, we're going to see here that this time period of Thyatira traces us down to about the year 1517. Around the year 1517. We're going to make that clear of why we bring it to this time period of around 1517 as we continue through our study. Now, what does the word Thyatira mean? What does the word Thyatira mean? The word Thyatira, it means odor of affliction. Or it also means perfume of affliction. And it also means sacrifice of contrition. Sacrifice of contrition. And you're like, what are, what are these words talking about? Affliction, contrition, odor, sacrifice. What is it talking about here? Why, what does this have to do with Thyatira? Well, it has much to do with Thyatira because we actually learn that as we're studying these topics, as we're studying these churches, that we're actually seeing the meaning of each name of the church is very synonymous. It's very calculated to the time period in which it's written for, to the time period of the church in which it's written for, and also the meanings of these churches' names of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, and the other churches that we'll look at. Also, they have a correlation and they're in direct connection. They have something to do with Jesus Christ. They actually show us of Jesus Christ. What do I mean by that? The word Ephesus, it means first and it also means desirable. Let me make sure I'm writing that right. First or desirable. What does that have to do with Jesus? The Bible says in the book of Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18 that Jesus is the one who has um, first, let's let's go there. Actually, I want to get the, I want to get it correct in what I'm trying to bring before you. Colossians chapter one and verse eighteen. Let's go there. It says Colossians chapter one and verse eighteen. Speaking of Jesus, it says, and He is the head of the body. Even the body, as we see in Ephesians five, is representing the church. The church. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Doesn't mean he's he's the firstborn from the dead. We're going to look at that in future study. It says that in all things he might have the preeminence. This being firstborn, Jesus is first and foremost. Jesus has the preeminence. Jesus is above all. Above all creation, he's the creator. Amen. So when we see this, this first, this desirable, and we're talking about desirable also. In the book of Haggai, chapter 2 and verse 7, write that down. Haggai, chapter 2 and verse 7, the Bible calls Jesus or the coming Messiah, 
the desire of all nations. The desire of all nations. Whether we know it or not, the yearning desire we have in our hearts for something greater than this world can offer is truly a desire for Jesus. That void in our heart that we're trying to fill with every other thing but Christ is for Christ. Jesus is the desire of all nations and he is to be first in our lives, in our hearts. And he is to be our desire, our desire. And if he is, friends, if Jesus has the preeminence in our life, if our job doesn't have our preeminence, if our um, situations in our life don't have our preeminence, if money doesn't have the preeminence, if Christ has the preeminence, then guess what? Everything else will fall into place. Everything else will fall into place. Jesus said, seek ye first what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness, Christ's righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now we look at Smyrna. Smyrna, the word Smyrna, what does that mean? It comes from the word, we see also the word or the oil known as myrrh. Myrrh. Myrrh was the number one oil used in the sanctuary as the anointing oil of the high priests and of different parts of the sanctuary. It was also used for bury, for burial. I guess my son's just bringing me it again here. Myrrh. It was used for, for burial. And it was used to anoint kings, prophets, priests, and so on. Myrrh. Myrrh. I'm going to look at it so I can spell it right. Mm-hmm. Okay, myrrh. Myrrh. Write this down. Write this down. What is it talking about here? Again, myrrh was that number one oil we seen from the book of Exodus used in the anointing oil of the priests and of the sanctuary. And Jesus, the Bible says in Acts 10, 38, that he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went forth to preach the gospel, to teach the nations, to do a work of healing, a complete restorative ministry that Christ bring as he was anointed at his baptism with the Holy Spirit. And we've seen that event of the baptism of Jesus in 27 AD was a crucial part of the prophecy found in Daniel chapter 9, where the Bible says that the, the Messiah, as the Messiah would come, that he would be anointed. That he would be anointed, and he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. The Messiah, the word Messiah means anointed one. So the, the time period of Smyrna shows Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus as the Savior, Jesus as the one who was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. And at this time, many of God's people were anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. And as they were about to give their lives, even unto death, they could testify because the Holy Spirit gave them power. The Holy Spirit bring things back to their remembrance to testify. And souls within the Roman Empire, souls who were heathens, souls who were pagans, were converted even at the, the deathbeds of many of God's people during this time. And Christ was testified of. Christ was testified of. Now we move on to Pergamus. What does Pergamus mean? Pergamus means height. It means height. And it means elevation. Height. Alonzo. It means height and it means elevation. Height and elevation. Now, what is it talking about here? How does height and elevation testify it's okay how does height and elevation testify of christ john chapter 12 in the book of john chapter 12 and verse 32 jesus says i if i be lifted up from the earth if i be lifted up if i be elevated if i be heightened from the earth 
Even upon the cross of Calvary, what will he do? He will draw all men. He will draw all of his creation onto himself. Due to the power of the cross, not as an emblem upon your neck and upon a chain, not as a uh, poster upon your, um, in your home, but the power of the cross, the converting power of the cross of Calvary, where the love of God was portrayed for mankind, where angels beheld and even veiled their faces as they seen their dying Savior upon the cross, as Jesus was giving his life a ransom for many, as Jesus was bringing man back to himself, as Jesus was reconciling us unto himself, angels even unto himself, that they could see the character of Satan and also see the true character of God as a self-sacrificing, loving God, Jesus was heightened, was elevated as never before, even from the beginning of creating angels and different um, beings, he was heightened and elevated as never before, as his true character was seen as never before, before the whole entire universe. And as we go and we read our Bibles, as we read those closing scenes of Jesus' earthly life during his first advent, we can be drawn to him. We can heighten and elevate him and we can be humbled in the dust. Amen? Now we go to Thyatira. Thyatira again, odor of affliction or sacrifice of contrition. I want to explain this biblically. Go to John chapter 12. Go to John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, something is happening. We, we see a scene here where Jesus is, is, is in a certain place He's having a feast with his disciples. He's with his friends. And this was a time when which Jesus was soon to go to the cross. Jesus, sit down. Jesus was soon to die. Jesus was soon to give his life a ransom for many. And not many at that table were, in fact, none at that table were truly appreciative. None of his disciples were meditating upon their Savior soon to die. They were thinking about who's the greatest. They were thinking about money. They were thinking about other things. But there came a woman, even a woman who was once impure, and this is going to be essential to what we're studying here, a woman who was once impure, but repented with tears and anointed Jesus for his burial. Connie, sit down. John chapter 12, verse 1. Let's look there. John chapter 12 and verse 1. The Bible says this in John chapter 12 and verse 1. It says, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, six days before his death, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which uh, was, which what had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. So Jesus had a, a dinner and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed hmm, the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. Hair is a symbol of glory. She was giving glory to God, even in repentance. And it says, and the house was filled with what? With the odor of the ointment. With the what? The odor of the women. And what was Jesus preparing for? Verse 7. Then said Jesus, let her alone. As, as his disciples, as the others at the table were bothering Mary. And were saying, why is she wasting her money upon Christ? What is the purpose of this waste? What is the purpose of wasting your cash, your money, your, your time upon Jesus? What's the point of giving back to his work? What's the point of giving time to Jesus? What's the point of spending time with Jesus? What it, what, it doesn't matter. We got the poor with us right here. We've we got to minister to them. But true ministry is ministering to Christ in the person of his saints. John chapter 12 and verse 7, the Bible says, Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of what? My burying has she kept this. Mary was preparing Jesus even in this odor of affliction, this sacrifice. Jesus was preparing for his sacrifice upon the cross of Calvary as he would die and be buried. Jesus was soon to give his life a ransom for many. 
Jesus was soon to sacrifice all, to give all. He left his Father's throne above, the song says. And he freely gave us all, friends, in his sacrifice upon the cross. In this odor of affliction, this odor of affliction, I pray that we're understanding that each time period of the Christian church, even by name, testifies of Christ's character. Testifies of Christ's character. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 2 now. Can you go sit down? Let's turn to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 18. The church of Thyatira is addressed here. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 18, the Bible says this, And unto the angel, or the messengers, of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God. When Jesus was addressing the other churches, let's look at how he addressed them. Let's look at how he first addressed Ephesus. Watch this. And unto the Revelation 2 and verse 1. And unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So now this is this symbolic meaning in which we can see where Jesus is at this time period in the holy place amongst the candlesticks. Symbolically, Jesus is showing himself. Let's turn down to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 8 now. It says, On unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Again, a symbolic meaning of Christ. First, last, dead, alive. Watch this. Revelation chapter 2 now. And verse 12, it says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he, which had the sharp two ed- or the sharp sword with two edges. Or even the word of God as Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 and 13 tell us. Symbolically, Jesus is being showing, shown as, as one who is in the midst of the candlesticks. As one who is first, last, dead, alive is one who is who is has the sharp two-edged sword. Now in Thyatira Jesus addresses himself and he does not it's not as if it's a veil covering Jesus, not as if there's there's a guess of who it is and you have to break it down to really see. Jesus addresses himself as he truly is the Son of God. Because in the time of Thyatira this was the time period known as the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages. So Jesus needs to come in his full light. Jesus needs to come in his full presence of who he truly is to address this time in which there is darkness covering the earth, even gross darkness, the people. Thyatira, again, Jesus addresses himself as the Son of God because of this time period. Jesus needs to be clear in who he is. He needs to be forward in who he is. And same for us. When we are in time periods of our lives where there is darkness or where there is times where we have to be direct towards people because what they're doing or saying is straight up rude, is straight up evil, we have to be plain with them. We can't try to you know, cover things up. We have to be direct, friends. And Jesus had to be in this time period as well. Let's continue. It says this, Revelation 2 and verse 18. It says, And unto the angel of the church in where? In Thyatira, write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are what? Like fine brass. His feet are what? Their feet are like fine brass. Jesus is revealed is in is as one who is what who has his eyes like onto a flame of fire what do you do with your eyes you see what do you do with your eyes you you're able to scan things you're able to see things clearly jesus is searching thyatira jesus is searching both classes both his people and he's purifying his people because fire was used 
not only to burn people, not only to sacrifice uh, and burn up the, the offerings that were given in the sanctuary, but fire was also used to purify. We see in Daniel chapter 3, when the three Hebrew worthies, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, or Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, were placed where? In a fiery furnace, heated even seven times hotter, and they went through that time period where the Son of God, even a fourth like unto the Son of God, was found in the midst of that fiery furnace. But what happened to Nebuchadnezzar's men? They were burned even before they, 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 as they were entering up into that burning oven. But God's people were purified through it. So fire represents purification, even removal of dross, of filthiness of the flesh and spirit, of um, defects in the character, and of things that would unfit us for God's kingdom. This was happening to God's people. They were being purified. Some of them were being burned on the stake in this time period, but they're also being purified. Their faith was. But also, fire is not just representing purification of God's people, but it's also representing judgment. It's also representing the coming of Christ. is representing because when Jesus comes, the elements are going to burn with fervent heat, Peter tells us. When Jesus comes, not only is the earth going to burn up, but even the wicked after the thousand years, when we see in Re when we will see in Revelation chapter twenty, in which God's people are judging the the wicked angels and the wicked inhabitants who did not repent, when they're judging them, when they come back, fire is going to come down from heaven and it's going to burn them up, friends. It's going to completely annihilate them because of their unrighteousness. Their own life of sin and their own unfitness for heaven is going to burn them up. And God remembers everything, friends. Remember that. God, God, God is not, you know, passing things by and, and He's saying, oh, what happened? What happened then? Oh. He records everything. We've seen that Jesus has a book of life. He has a book of death. He has a book of remembrance. He remembers everything. And God remembers what his servants went through during this time, this extreme time of persecution. Because this time period also runs through a majority of the papal dominion from 538 to what? 1798. We studied that before. The 1260 years of papal dominion. It runs through that time, but it ends at a certain time period here around the 1500 because something great happens which prepares us for the time period of Sardis. Prepares us for the time period of Sardis. So this this flame of fire is denoting that there's going to be judgment upon the wicked, upon even this class of individuals, even upon this great um, entity and church known as the Roman Catholic Church, not upon every individual, a part of it, no, friends, but upon the system Jesus is going to burn up. Why is Jesus mentioned also as what? Having what? Feet like fine brass. Some of you say, well, his feet are like fine brass because he, Jesus is a black man. That's, that's why his feet are fine. It's, it's just denoting his color. We have to remember Revelation is a symbolic book, friends. So we're not looking at literal skin color of Christ. Nobody knows that. But we, we know that this brass, as we study the Bible, because we're looking at the Bible, not our own opinions, not the opinions of men, not the opinions of uh, bigots, but we're looking at the Bible. When we look at brass, we see two occasions where, where, where individuals were even clothed in brass, even down to their feet. One of them was an individual named Goliath. Goliath. He had a, a, uh, a coat of mail, the Bible says. He, has, he had uh, brass was covering him. Do we also see brass in the symbol of Daniel chapter 2? We see in the, the head of gold, the belly uh, or the arms and chest of silver, and the belly and thighs of what? Of brass. In each of these kingdoms was judged. Was Goliath also judged? Was Goliath an individual 
who exalted himself against the Most High? Was he a one who persecuted or sought to destroy or wear out God's people? He was trying to destroy the Israelites. He was trying to enslave them. He was using his 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 giant stature. He was using his his physical prowess and presence to try to intimidate, to try to persuade, and to try to destroy God's people. But as he made a challenge to one of God's faithful servants, he could not stand. That smooth stone whacked him in his forehead. That, that rock whacked him on his forehead. And what happens in Daniel chapter 2 to that image? It is destroyed by a stone, even by the son of David, even by Jesus Christ himself. Another individual where we see in the Bible clothed or, or denoting where he's in the presence of brass is a king named King Og in the time of Moses. As, as, as the Israelites were conquering lands, King Og was laying in a bed of brass and he was destroyed himself. His probation closed. Judgment fell upon him, friends. God is going to judge this wicked church. He's going to judge this wicked system. He's going to judge them, friends. Not every individual again. Because some people will say, man, you're pretty harsh. You're pretty harsh. You're talking about Roman Catholic churches. This wicked, friends, we're talking about the system. The system in which Satan himself sits upon satan exalts himself as as a man is exalted anyone who is exalted above god satan is exalted because his character is revealed through the exaltation of men through the demoralization of civilizations through the persecution of god's people in this time period friends millions of true christians many of god's people were martyred they were burned. They were, don't want to list every atrocity, chopped up. They were buried. All types of evil that you can imagine, don't imagine it, happened during this time. To God's people, in which there was a destruction of, of, of certain groups that, that the papacy deemed as, as pests, known as the Waldensians. Even to their very homes, the, the papacy sent out soldiers to go and persecute and to destroy and to kill even Waldensians. Children, even in their mother's arms. The Albigenses, the Huguenots, all these different groups throughout Europe, France and, and Italy and, and England, um, the Lombards, all these... Oh, pardon me, not the the Lollards, all these individuals were deemed hateful friends by the Roman Catholic Church, by the popes, by the priests, by those Nicolaitans, by those Balaamites, by those Balakites, by those, by Jezebel. What are you talking about here, Jezebel? Let's continue, let's continue. Let's continue. It says here in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 19, we'll look at. It says, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. This is speaking to God's people directly who are faithful. God knows what they were going through during this time. Verse 20, it says, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. They made some mistakes just like Ephesus. Not, not in losing the first love, but what happened? It says, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants. Many of God's professed people still found themselves within the control of the papacy still believing many of her doctrines, not living up to the full light, not full light had not truly penetrated the hearts and minds. And it was not, it did not progress as it should, 
even during this time in which there were faithful Christians, not to take that away, there were faithful Christians, but they suffered that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce. What was she doing? Two things. She was teaching. She was seducing. What is Jezebel? Jezebel, we see in the Old Testament, was a literal woman, a woman whose father was a heathen, was a Baal worshiper, and who got into the life of a Israelite king known as Ahab, seduced him basically, married him, controlled him, and destroyed many of God's people, many of God's prophets. She kept the rain from coming because of her ungodliness, because of her seduction and her teachings her teachings because this, the woman Jezebel was doing two things again she was teaching and seducing and we see even in the time period of Pergamos in the time period where where Balaam and Balak were also exalted not literal individuals they already died but this false educational system in which Thyatira in this this false system this Roman Catholic Church took this false educational system and completely darkened the minds of men. They took away the Bible. And, and only those who were rich, educated in a high class of society could, uh, could get an education. The rest were kept dumb and stupid. The rest were kept in their cages, as it were. The rest were kept in the pews, giving of their, their, their light bread, giving of their pieces of, of little morsels of bread, giving up their little change here and there, and which exalted the church of the Roman Catholic Church to a point in which she could build cathedrals, she could build uh, basilicas, she could build all types of things. She could exalt herself, wear fancy clothes, because the poor were suppressed. The poor were suppressed. Was that not happening in the time period where Jezebel was controlling the kings of the earth or the king of the earth? Ahab? Was that not happening? Of course it was, friends. Jezebel Jezebel is representative of this class in Thyatira who is the epitome of false concepts, of false education, of, of evil, of adultery, of everything unlike Christ's character. Of everything unlike Christ's character. And unlike Mary who was a prostitute who repented with tears and turned from her sins. She went and sinned no more by the grace and power of God. This woman, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 21, that God gave her or Jezebel space to repent of her fornication. And she did not. She did not repent. She repented not, the Bible says. Jesus gives everyone an opportunity. He gives all of us ample opportunities and privileges to turn from our sins. With what, no matter what light we have of truth, Jesus gives us opportunities to repent. But this woman, she was so exalted. She was a prophetess. And a prophet or a prophetess, their words are infallible. Their words are authoritative. This woman exalted her words. This woman said, I sit in this seat, in Satan's seat, because Jezebel also means married to Satan, married to Baal, Jezebel, Jezebel. She was married to Satan. Satan was her husband. And how did she come to this point in which she became this impure woman? How did she come to this point in which she, she exalted herself even as infallible? Let's look at the Bible here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 2. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse number 2. The Bible says this. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. The Bible says, For I am jealous over you, God says, with a godly jealousy. For I have exposed you to one husband that i may present you as a chaste 
virgin to Christ. And you might say, well, Jezebel was only married to Ahab. Was she? Her name means married to Satan. She had another husband already. And even after that, she painted her face, looked out a window, and, and, and this, this harlotry that she, that she was presenting before other men, what was she really doing? She was seducing God's servants. She was seducing God's people. But there will be true Elijahs. There will be true uh, Jehus who will not be seduced by Jezebel. Who will say, throw that woman out the window. That woman needs to be cast down. That, that is impure. And they will exalt the truth of God. The pure, the Bible says, the pure word of God. They will exalt the truth of God. They will exalt Jesus Christ, the pure, undefiled, unspotted Lamb of God. This woman is full of spots. She's full of wrinkles. She tries to cover up her wrinkles with skin care. She tries to cover up her, her blemishes with makeup. She tries to cover up uh, her all of her impurities. There's a cover-up for it. But for all of our impurities, we can be made pure we're not trying to cover our impurities we're trying to have our impurities eradicated done away with whether it be through surgery whether it be through whatever means that it has to be cut off cut out jesus wants us to be pure and as we behold him as we think upon jesus as we spend time with him as we await his second coming the bible says every man that has this hope within himself purifies himself even as he is pure. This woman is impure. Though. Impure. This woman is defiled with men. She's defiled with the kings of the earth. She is married to different men. And as she was given space to repent of her fornication, as she was given space to repent of marrying the state, because also Pergamus, let's write this down, Pergamus also means what? Marriage. What was happening in What was happening in Pergamus came into Thyatira. This false marriage of the church and state came in to Thyatira and it completely discombobulated it. What else was happening? Why did not this woman why, how did she become impure? How did this woman become impure? Because a woman in Bible prophecy, Jeremiah 6 and verse 2, is likened unto the church. So we see in this time period, not only two different classes, but two different churches. Because friends, through everything, we, we know that, you know, for many of us, we see, you know, this denomination, that denomination, this church, that church, Everybody's going to church. Everybody's at a different church. But guess what? There's only two different churches. There's the false church. And there's the true church. And we are going to see that come to a head in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 19. We're going to see that this church. That there's two different churches. Only whether we call ourselves Presbyterian, Methodist, Episcopal, um, Pentecostal, Seventh-day Adventist, Catholic, whatever we call ourselves, one, one, these churches are found in either one of those groups. They're either part of the true church or they're part of the false church. And we're going to see clearly when we identify the woman in Revelation chapter 12, who God's true church, who his remnant is who the remnant of her seed is. And we're also going to see in that church that there's true servants. There might be the remnant, but there's true servants because this is who the book of Revelation is written for, the servants of God. Also, um, let's turn to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 here. On our last few points, Ephesians chapter 5. And let's look at verse 23. Speaking of this woman, what, was, what happened to this woman, this woman Jezebel, to, that she became so impure? What happened to this, this, this church that should have been the true church, that could have been the true church, but she became the embodiment of the false church because she adopted 
all of the false principles, the Nicolaitans. She adopted the, the, the uh, taking of God's people to... Uh, she adopted taking those who profess to be God's servants and to um, bribe them to betray God's people. She adopted this height, this elevation. She adopted Balaam in Balak principle. She adopted the Nicolaitans even more. She adopted Satan's seat. She took Satan's seat. She sat upon it. And she became known as this impure woman, Jezebel. God had to define her as only a, one person in the Bible could be found as known as Jezebel. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23, the Bible says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. This woman found herself, she said, I'm the head of the church. I'm the mother. And all these harlots, all these daughters are mine. She, she, she exalted herself as the head of the church. She exalted herself as the head of the kingdom. She exalted herself as above all things, even God himself. Let's continue. It says, and Jesus is the savior of the body. This woman said, guess what? If, if, you, if, if you are want salvation, you have to be attached to the church. If you want salvation, you have to baptize your babies. If you want salvation, you have to donate to this church. If you want salvation, and, and every, every type of bribery, every type of fear that you could place into the heart of darkened minds during this time, she did. And she sought to become the Savior. It says, verse 24, Ephesians 5, verse 24, it says, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ... This church tried to make Jesus subject to her. So let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and he gave himself for it. This church stopped doing service. This church did away with service and she exalted herself. And she said, you must serve me. You must wash my feet. You must kiss my ring. You must serve me. I am the one who is going to be on horses and chariots riding through. When Jesus came on a mule, on a donkey, and he we had palm branches waved before him as, he, as he's wearing his, his normal clothing. And he accepted the worship because he's the son of God. He's God himself. But this woman accepted the worship that was only due to Jesus Christ. And she became an impure woman. Let's continue. Ephesians 5 and verse 32. It says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Christ and his bride. Christ and his people. Christ and his true church. Because in Thyatira, not only do we find the false church, not only do we find this false system, this false religious system, but we also see God's true people. We also see the, the individuals who exalted Jesus, who exalted his mediation, who exalted his kingdom, who exalted his righteousness, who exalted him as Savior, him as Messiah, him as high priest, and would not bow the knee to worship a pope, who would not bow the knee to give homage to priests, to prelates, or to men. Amen. Let's continue. What else was this woman doing? She was, she was, let's continue. A fee, uh, pardon me. Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. What was Jezebel doing? Uh, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20. It says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself. This is, this is a self-exaltation. She calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication. The seventh commandment was greatly broken during this time. And to eat things sacrificed unto idols. What was going on here? To eat things sacrificed unto idols. What was sacrificed during this time? 
the gospel, friends. The gospel was sacrificed during this time. Christ, again, the Bible says that Jesus, he suffered once for the sins of the world. Jesus suffered once for the sins of the world. Jesus died once for man. In the greatest sacrifice, the most perfect sacrifice. But this woman put Jesus to the cross afresh. They put Jesus to open shame. And they demoralized the Ten Commandments by eating things sacrificed to idols. The second commandment says that we, that we should not bow down to graven images. What was this church doing? They were making people come into churches and to bow down to statues of Mary. They were making them bow down to, to rosaries and all these different things. Men and women and children were taught to eat things sacrificed to idols. They were taught idolatry in something that professed to be a Christian church. But Jesus said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. He said, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. He said, You shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. He said, Remember the Sabbath day. And all of these four commandments, along with the rest, were sacrificed. They were expunged from the minds of men. It was as if men lived in a time period as if there's no existence of the Ten Commandments. There's no existence of the moral law of God. This was one of the most immoral times in the history of mankind. It's almost like today. You might say, but no, we... I believe in the Ten Commandments. I mean... Society is getting better than it was in the dark ages, is it really? Because a dark age, friends, is whenever, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. A dark age is whenever the word of God is not read, studied, applied, obeyed, and lived out practically. This is a dark age. Are we having a dark age in our home? Are we having a dark age in, in our workplace? Are we having a dark age where we live? Is there a dark age? Is the Bible collecting dust on yourself? And if it's opened, is it truly obeyed? Because if it's not, it's a dark age, friends. And I'm speaking this to myself. I'm speaking this to you. This is truth as God speaks. That we are in a dark age when we don't obey the word of God. Let's continue. Let's continue. Or before we look, before we move on, let's, let's continue. Let's continue actually in looking at things sacrificed unto idols. Let's continue here and let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Sit down, please. And verse... Let's start in verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. Looking at this sacrifice, uh, eating things sacrificed to idols. What is it talking about here? What is it talking about here? Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. The Bible says, Be not unequally yoked together with what? Unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion has light with darkness? And what concord, what agreement has Christ with Belial? And what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Hmm. And I will receive you and will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. This is the new covenant right here. But what was happening? What is this eating things sacrificed to idols? It's not just idolatry. It's not just breaking the second commandment and esponging it from the Ten Commandments, replacing it with the Tenth Commandment. But this eating things sacrificed to idols is a blending of paganism and Christianity. It's a blend, friends. Have you ever seen a couple? One, one, maybe the woman is a Christian or the man, and the 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 man or the woman, what the the woman? Let's for example, let's say the woman is a Christian and the man is a he's a heathen. He's he's just out there, and they try to come together. They try to have children. And they try to come together and they try to agree together. One says, you know, I, I, want, I want us to eat this way. I want us to live this way and to do this thing. And so 
No, I don't want to do that. I want to eat what I want. I want to do what I want. I want to do whatever I want. There's no agreement, friends. And at this time, paganism and Christianity blended. And whenever there's a blend with God's truth, God's truth is destroyed. What happened in the Garden of Eden? All Satan said, as ye shall not surely die. Hath God said? He just changed a little bit. All there has to be is a little bit of compromise and the truth of God is destroyed. And this is what happened during this time. Because paganism was, was in the garb of Christianity, it was truly paganism. It was truly Satan's religion. It was truly false system of religion. Exalted. Satan exalted. Man exalted. In God's truth, Jesus Christ, his servants, degraded to where they could put hats upon martyrs. They could put hats upon those who went against the teachings of their church. They could put demon hats on them and, and, and commit their soul to the devil. John they could kill God's servants without any conviction without any repentance afterwards and friends we are we are not just trying to bel belabor the point and trying to just beat down the papacy but we're also trying to show that the same things happen today the same things happen today literally in the lives of men they try to blend christ and the world and it never mixes they try to blend this oil and this water and they don't try to allow the blood and the water from Christ's side to purify their lives. They try to blend. They try to hold on to their past. They try to hold on to what they love carnally and they don't move on. They don't progress and they heighten, they elevate a life of sin, professing to elevate Christ and they marry their sins. They, they put Christ to open shame. They don't allow that odor of Christ's sacrifice, that sweet-smelling savor onto God the Father of Jesus' sacrifice to be a sweet-smelling savor, to, be, to convert their souls. They don't allow it, friends. And we come to a point in our lives where all we talk about is Jesus on the cross. Where all we talk about is Jesus dying for us, but we don't talk about him as a resurrected Savior. We don't talk about him as a high priest. We only talk about Jesus' death on the cross. And we think that Jesus is just a dying Savior. We leave him there as a dying lamb. We leave him there upon our walls and on our bookshelves. We leave him there upon our necklaces and keychains as a cross. We say, Jesus is dead. He's dead in my life. We don't literally say that. We profess that he's, he's living in our hearts, but he's dead. He's dead, friend, because we don't want the life of Christ. We don't want to allow Christ to convert our souls. But I pray this would not be our experience any longer. We need not to be like this Jezebel who was given space to repent and she repented not. We need to repent today. We need to ask God for true godly sorrow for our sins, friends. We need to ask him today. Let's continue as we close out. Let's continue as we close out. We're going to come back at maybe a later time and come back and, and, and add more to Thyatira if need be. But let's turn down to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 24. Because we're going to come back. We need to come back. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 24. It says, But unto you I say, and unto the rest. Hmm? Unto you and unto the rest. When, when God is, when, when the prophet John is writing this, and Jesus is, is, is giving him this revelation. God is speaking unto you, unto his people, and unto the rest. This was the false professors of Christianity. In Thyatira, it says, Revelation 2 and verse 24, As many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden god's people friends during this time they could only do so much they could only do so much going up against this goliath they could only do so much they had the smooth stones but this woman jezebel teaches us 
the depths of Satan. This woman Jezebel teaches us how far we will go in sin when we choose to hold on to it. This woman Jezebel teaches us what we will do to God's people, what we will do to his servants. We may have Bibles, friends. We may have Bibles, but if our hearts are closed to the truth and to the power that is in the scriptures, we are as Jezebel. We are killing God's servants. Oh, Jeremiah is telling me my heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, I, I, I'm okay. My heart is okay. No, I don't have to worry about that. Isaiah is telling me great. Isaiah is telling me that if I take hold of God's strength and make peace with him, that I will have peace with him. But I'm strong enough. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. And we're killing God's servants. We're destroying. Jesus is saying, come on to me. And we say, no, no, no. I can't come right now. I'm too busy. I'm too busy living my life, living my best life. I'm too busy living in the fast lane. And Jesus is saying, open the door of your hearts. And you say, not right now, not right now. That devotion you're calling to me in the morning too, not right now. I've got to get to work. And friends, we are doing exactly what Jezebel did. Because Jezebel, even herself, that literal woman, was giving space to repent. She came into contact with a prophet, a true prophet of God. She came into contact with the word of God. Because Elijah was able to shut up heaven. He was able to keep the rain from coming. The word of God is able to do the same. He was only speaking the word of God. She came into contact with the word of God. She came into contact with the truth of God. She came into contact with one of God's servants. She came into contact with the character of Christ. And she turned away. She turned away and she went after Elijah. Let's close on our last verse. Last couple verses, pardon me. Because we need to cover this point too. Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to give you about, we got three more scriptures, okay? Revelation chapter 2. Thanks for your patience. Revelation chapter 2 and verse... <clears throat> We'll continue in verse 25. It says, But that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. It's speaking about the second coming of Christ. Hold fast till I come. The prospect that soon this weariness, this, 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 this persecution would end. Verse 26, and it says, And he that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. You know how powerful that is? God is promising to his people power over the nations, but look at this. What was Jezebel doing? She wanted power over the nation. She wanted power over the state. She wanted power over the religious affairs and the political affairs. She wanted power over the whole earth. But Jesus is saying, if you hold fast till I come, if, I mean, if you, yes, hold fast till I come, I will give you power. Go, go with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 45. I wasn't going to do this verse, but this, this is very um, potent right here. It says, Isaiah chapter 45 and verse number 1. Isaiah chapter 45 in verse number one, we're going to close here soon. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse number one, the Bible says this. Are we there in Isaiah chapter 45 and verse one? Amen. It says, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, who is a Persian king, whose right hand I have holden. The Bible says in Isaiah 41 and verse 10, it says in Isaiah 41 and verse 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Jesus says, Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And it says, To subdue nations before him. The Bible says of Christ in Philippians 3 and verse 21, that he has power to subdue all 
things unto himself. In John 17 and verse 1, the Bible says of Christ that he has been given power over all flesh, even ours. We can give him power over our flesh. We can allow our hearts to be subdued under his power. So the Bible says in Isaiah 45 that Cyrus was given the ability. Even God miraculously opened the two leaf gates in Babylon, back there in Babylon's time, and the gates shall not be shut. Jesus says, I will open a door for you. A door that seem doors that seem insurmountable in your life to be open. I will open if you take hold of my strength. If you lay down self upon the altar and allow self to be subdued. And friends, this is naturally hard. We don't want to do it. But as we see Christ heightened, elevated, as we come into union or marriage with Christ, we can come to a point where as we behold Christ's sacrifice, as the odor of his sacrifice permeates our lives, we can allow Christ to open doors and close doors. To open doors, opportunities, to witness for him, opportunities in our lives that we never seen were there, Jesus can do it. Revelation chapter 2. One second, buddy. Revelation chapter 2. <clears throat> or Psalms chapter 2. Pardon me. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 27. It says, And he shall rule them, Jesus, with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. What is this talking about, this rod of iron? Turn with me to Psalms chapter 2. What is it talking about here with this rod of iron? Because all of the books of the Bible, they meet and they end in the book of Revelation. All of the books of the Bible. Including the book of Psalms, the biggest book of the Bible. Psalms chapter 2. Let's turn there with me. Psalms chapter 2. What is it talking about, this rod of iron? There is a prophecy here in Psalms chapter 2 of Christ. Psalms chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse number 1. Psalms 2 and verse 1. It says this, Why do the heathen rage, and the people imagine a vain thing? It says, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, and against His anointed. Saying what? Let us break their bands asunder, and cast away their cords from us. Verse 8. Verse 8. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. It says, Thou shalt break them with what? A rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. What is it speaking about here? In, Revel in Psalms chapter 2, the Bible is speaking of how the, the kings of the earth, or how the heathen, the heathens are, are that's, that's a religious aspect right there. The kings of the earth, that's that political state aspect right there. How the church and state would come together against the Lord, against Jesus, and against his anointed, his people, Christ and his people. How they would come against them, and they would seek to destroy them. But Jesus said that he is the one who sits in the heavens. That he is the one that will laugh at them. Jesus will have to, friends, because of the 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 defiance of Jezebel Jesus will have to punish with a rod of iron Jesus will have to punish at his second coming the wicked friends sadly and the Bible says in Isaiah that this is a strange work look at Revelation chapter 19 for a second does it say that at the second coming of Jesus that Jesus will come and Jesus will have to do a work to punish that, that, that nations, that kings of the earth, and that the heathen will be punished. Look at this. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 15. Revelation 19 and verse 15. The Bible says this. And out of Jesus' mouth, out of his mouth, goeth a sharp sword, the word of God, that with it he should smite the nations just by his word. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. When Jesus comes back the second time, friends, he is coming as a king. He is coming to subdue 
the nations. He is coming to put down unrighteousness. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5. The Bible says this. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5. This prophecy of Christ at his birth, he was prophesied as one who would rule with a rod of iron. Look at this. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5. And she, the woman, the church, even literally Mary, the mother of Jesus, brought forth a man child who was, that's future, to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Jesus has gone where? He's gone before the Father. Where is Jesus now? He's before the Father. He's presenting his nail-pierced hands. Jesus is before the Father. He's before his throne as Daniel tells us that thrones were set up that the Ancient of Days did sit and 10,000 times 10,000 this time of judgment which was not literally in the time of Thyatira but right now Jesus is coming with a rod of iron. Jesus is coming and all of the wickedness that happened to God's people from Jezebel. Literally Jezebel in the Old Testament. Spiritually Jezebel, this wicked impure woman found in Revelation 17 verse 1 and 2. That mother of all harlots. She will be punished, friends. She will receive the just recompense of her deed. She will receive even the second death. She will receive the plagues. She will receive these things. Not because God is diabolical. No, no, no. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave and he gave this woman also space to repent. And she repented not. Our last closing verse. As we close out here, friends. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 19. Our last closing verse. And then we close in prayer. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 19. The Bible says this. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 19, again, we repeat it. It says, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. During this time of papal persecution, friends, it seemed as if the people of God would be destroyed from off the earth. It seems as though 50 to 100 million Christians persecuted during this time. What will be left? There's, there's going to be a genocide again. It seemed as if no more of God's people would exist. But again, the blood of Christians, the blood of God's people, the blood of His saints is seed. And the death of many of God's people, it sowed a seed in the hearts of those who did not know Jesus and they became servants. They became servants. Until the end of this time, friends, until this time period in 1517, which we're going to come back to when we look at Sardis, in around the year 1517, we're going to see when we come back to Sardis, a powerful movement, a powerful movement, revolution a powerful reformation that protests against the abominations of jezebel comes into play and it really kicks up and different um things that come into play during this time period of sardis which we're going to look at puts jezebel to her knees friends and i choose today to exalt those things that Jesus exalts, even the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And I choose by His grace to allow His Word to dwell so that when He comes with a rod of iron, I would remain standing and I would remain in His care and not pressed down, not destroyed by the stone, friends. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this study here today. We've seen a lot of things with Thyatira, and I pray that we would practically apply not only the information, but the spiritual truth of your word to our hearts. It's not enough to be a hearer of the word. We need to be doers. So we pray for your grace and strength and power to be doers of the word. Help us to come back at the next appointed time to continue our study through the book of Revelation, that we may understand intellectually, 
spiritually and practically that we may not be moved. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, friends. Thank you for tuning in. Come back next week. Hear from Keys to Christ Ministries. God bless.